Good evening. Welcome to the Science Laboratories at Roxbury Community College. My name is Hillel Sims and I'm the director for the Science Laboratories. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to some of the health and safety aspects of working in our labs. So we're going to go over both equipment as well as how to follow certain procedures. Now what I'd like to point out to you is that this video is going to be somewhat generic. This is going to go over in general aspects of health and safety, but we have 10 different lab spaces here at Roxbury Community College. So that means that the safety shower or eye wash station that you may have in your lab space is not always going to look the same as the ones in the lab space next door. So the faculty member who is teaching your course will go over with you both the location for these pieces of equipment as well as how to use them in addition to showing you this video. So what I mean by that is this, for example, is a safety shower. In the labs that you work in, the safety shower may have rope poles instead of the metal poles. It might have different colors for the cone here on the end. But in general, it will always work the same. The eyewash stations also. Many of the eyewash stations are like this. They can actually be pulled off. They have a hand trigger to use. However, some of the eyewash stations that we have here are mounted to the desk, and they have a lever that you push to use them. Either way, they're both eyewash stations and they both function the same way. I'd like to take this opportunity to go over with you the various types of waste containers that you're going to find in the lab. Now this is important not only for your safety, but for the safety of the staff that works in the laboratory and the waste people that are going to come to pick things up. For instance, you wouldn't want to put any liquid waste inside one of our glass or sharps waste containers, and vice versa. Nobody who's picking up any of our liquid chemical waste would want to find lots of glass tubes inside the, the jar. So, if I can, I'll take a minute to go over with you the different categories and the different types of material that you're going to put into the containers. There are two types of glass waste containers that you'll find in the lab. One of them is a large cardboard container like this with a flap on the top of it. This is where you put most of your large type glass waste. So for instance, if you broke a graduated cylinder or an Erlenmeyer flask or something along those lines, that would go into this kind of container. Now on the other hand, you're going to find other containers like this. They're going to be marked broken glass or some of them will actually be marked just broken slides. So in these types of containers, specifically, we put our glass slides. So an example of that is this. So there's going to be two types of glass slides you're going to find. Ones like this, where you'll make the specimen yourself, or ones that, like in here that are coming from a company. So if you notice, they actually have labels on them that say what the particular item is. They have sometimes our color-coded and number-coded system. So it's very important that the glass slides end up in this type of container. We'll be able to identify what slides have broken and replace them, or potentially even repair broken slides. Now, now, you're going to find that there are two types of biohazard containers in the laboratory. One of them, which is a large pail like this and labeled just biohazard solid waste on the top. So this doesn't mean it has to be dry, but it does mean that you don't pour liquids into it. So if you've got something that's wet but still solid, that can go in here. The other type of biohazard container is specifically marked as a sharps collection container as well as biohazard. So the distinction between these two is anything that is, in that particular case, sharp. So a needle, for instance, you would want to put in here. And the reason you would want to do that is, when this type of container is collected, there's a bag that we pull out of it. So any kind of sharp biohazard item would pierce that bag. Not only would things potentially fall out or leak out, but somebody could hurt themselves considerably picking up a bag where then a sharp item could poke them. That's why those kind of items are specifically collected in here. So, in addition, if you remember I mentioned to you the concept of glass waste containers being separate from the bio waste containers, the distinction here is whether or not something that's glass has been exposed to a biohazard. 
So if you have a pasture pipette, so that's a glass type pipette, or maybe a serological pipette like this, in which case this one is glass, and it's been used with some sort of biohazard, so maybe a chemical that's hazardous, or maybe some bacteria or tissue culture, those kind of items would have to go into a container like this. However, some serological pipettes, so this one in, for instance, is made out of plastic. This is not considered to be a sharps. It's dull on the end and would not, in theory, poke through this type of bag. So in that case, this kind of item you would dispose of into the larger container. Other things to keep in mind for the Sharps container. So if you'll come over here and take a look. This is a, a perfect example of dissection equipment that is used in our anatomy and physiology and biology laboratories. We often find that students think that things like the scalpels should be thrown out in these containers. That is not true. These are reused. If at any point the blade on the scalpel becomes broken or dulled, we'll actually remove the blade and we will dispose of it in those containers. What you can do for us is if you notice one that's like that, please bring it to the attention of the faculty who's teaching your course. They will set it aside and make sure that the technician staff knows to dispose of it. Same thing with other items. Things like pins used for the dissections, they get reused. Scissors, tweezers, and probes. All of these items are reused throughout the course. Please do not dispose of them in the Sharps waste container. Put them back onto this tray, or if you had to rinse them off, please rinse them off and then put them in the appropriate location for them to dry. I'd like to go over with you now the last type of waste container that you may find in the lab, the liquid waste containers. Now, the liquid waste containers, in general, but not always, are in large 2.5 liter or 4 liter amber bottles like this. Now, I say sometimes they're in smaller bottles, and in, for instance, microbio, we have a very large 5-gallon carboy. So they can look a little bit different than this. In general, these bottles will be found inside a fume hood. This is our satellite accumulation area. They will be inside a secondary waste container. And the secondary waste container is extremely important. The reason for this is, should this bottle ever break? Should the bottle ever overflow? Or should anything ever spill out of the bottle? This secondary container will catch that, preventing a waste from spilling out on the bench or onto any person. In addition, the thing that you should always note is that hazardous waste bottles will have a label on it that says hazardous waste. It also contains all the important pertinent information. It will list the names of the different chemicals that are inside the waste container, and it will not be in an abbreviated form. So for example, you will not see HCL written on here. It will always be written as hydrochloric acid. It will also tell you about the type of waste. So in this case, it will tell you whether it's ignitable, so flammable, toxic, corrosive, reactive, or an oxidizer. Now, because we have multiple laboratories running within the same room, it means that you may find different courses waste bottles in the hood. You may find that your particular experiment for the day has more than one type of waste bottle associated with it. The important thing is all our waste bottles are labeled with both the course number the course name, and the experiment for that day. So for instance, this is our Psi 124 Principles of Chemistry 2, and it's the determination of equilibrium constant. So this will prevent you from hopefully confusing it with the Principles of Chemistry 1 course and its waste containers, and you'll also be able to make sure that your particular experiment uses this waste container. In addition, you'll want to match up. If you are disposing of ferric acid, you know that you can put the ferric acid into this container. In addition, some of the waste containers you'll find have funnels in the, in the secondary container for you to use. What you would want to do at that point is take the cap off, put the funnel in, pour your waste into the waste container. 
Now at this point, you need to make sure that all the liquid's gone through and then put the funnel back into the secondary. We don't want to leave that out because remember that has some waste on it as well. And then make sure you recap the container. This is to, even though it's in a fume hood, this is to prevent any of the liquid vapor from escaping and hurting anyone potentially. I'd like to go over with you now what we call PPE, or Personal Protective Equipment. This is the items that you're going to wear in the laboratory to keep you safe. So the first one that I like to mention are gloves. So in the laboratories at Roxbury Community College, we have five different sizes. Extra small, small, medium, large, and extra large. Now for those of you who are concerned that some gloves on the market are latex gloves and maybe you have an allergy, we do not have any latex gloves at Roxbury Community College. If you look at these boxes, they all say that they are latex free and they will actually say that they are nitrile gloves. So you don't have to worry about that allergy. The second item of personal protective equipment is your lab coat. Now, you might be saying, well, why do I need to wear a lab coat? I have long sleeves on right now. I have long pants on right now. I'm covered. Well, the lab coat serves two functions. It not only protects you personally, but it protects your clothing as well. You might have worn a very nice outfit to the lab today and you don't want stains like bromophemal blue or gram stain material to get on that nice piece of clothing. So by putting on this lab coat, I've not only protected myself, but the clothing that I'm wearing. The third item of personal protective equipment is your eye protection. So in this case, goggles. Now again, you're probably asking, well, I'm wearing glasses. That protects my eyes. Why do I need to wear goggles? If you take a look, comparing my glasses to my goggles, you'll see that my glasses don't cover nearly as much protection as these goggles do. So my recommendation for people that have glasses is to keep your glasses on and fit the goggles right over them. Not only have I now increased the amount of protection on the front, but I have side protection and top protection that I did not have at all from my glasses. The fourth item of personal protective equipment is one that we do not provide, and that's closed-toed shoes. So if you notice, I'm not wearing sandals or flip-flops. And I understand that it's sometimes during the year, especially in the summer, it's warm and it's nice weather out and people like to wear sandals and flip-flops around. They don't want to wear closed-toed shoes all day. If that's the case, what we would ask you to do is come in whatever shoes you feel like, but please bring an extra pair of shoes with you that's closed-toed to the laboratory. So that that way when you get here, you change your shoes, you wear closed-toed shoes for the lab, and then you can change again when you leave. But that way you're safe while you're here. These are some examples of appropriate and inappropriate footwear for the laboratory. Every laboratory space at Roxbury Community College comes equipped with a safety shower. This is an example of one. It'll have a conical shaped end on top to direct the water and it'll have a pulley system somewhere on the side that will activate the water. So in this case, it's a rope. In some cases, it's a metal uh, pipe to pull down on. But please keep in mind, you want to use the safety shower if you get chemicals or any kind of fire on you. If you were, for instance, to get something in your eye, you'd want to use the eye wash station. So remember, use the proper safety equipment under the right circumstances. But to demonstrate for you how the safety shower works, when you pull down, 20 gallons per minute is going to come out of this safety shower. So please, don't activate the safety shower unless you really mean to. I'd like to take this opportunity to show you how to use the eyewash station. So this is an example of one of the eyewashes that you'll find at Roxbury Community College. It's attached to a hose like this and you can use it to shoot the water into the sink as well as elsewhere should it be necessary. But keep in mind, you only want to use the eye wash if you got something in your eye. 
we want to try to avoid something like that as much as possible. So, the most important thing is to remember to wear your eye protection. So, in this case, I'm wearing glasses. For people that don't wear glasses, we have goggles available throughout all the laboratory spaces. In addition, I should point out that goggles will be much better than using glasses. The goggles protect a larger surface area, they protect on the side, and they protect on top. Now for those of you who want to be able to wear your glasses and the goggles, keep in mind you can do that. The goggles can actually fit right over your existing glasses. So now to demonstrate how the eye wash station is used, there's a handle here that if you grip this handle, water is going to come shooting out these two eye openings. So you want to try to aim it into the sink, and as you can see the water goes out. There's also a safety latch on the side. When this safety latch is engaged, if you notice, I can just let go of the handle, and so I can run the eye wash station without having to sit there gripping it the entire time. To let go of the safety, just grip the handle again and let, and let it open up. All right. So now, to show you what it looks like when you're shooting yourself in the eye, <laughs> you would want to angle over the sink like this and make sure it shoots you directly in the eye. Now keep in mind, if this was a real emergency, you would want to be doing this for 15 minutes. And please, keep in mind that 15 minutes of shooting yourself in the eye with an eye wash station is probably going to irritate your eyes. So, after you're done using the eye wash station, if your eyes feel a bit red and irritated, give yourself a little bit of time because it might be that the water itself has irritated your eyes.